All right, good morning. We're going to begin the next session. My name is Erin Garvey from Phoenix Children's, and this is my co-moderator, David Notrika, also from Phoenix Children's. Just a reminder to everyone, when you approach the microphone during the question and answer session, please state your name and institution. And now we are happy to begin our session. Our first speaker is Ray Hankey from Cincinnati Children's. She'll be presenting her video, Is It Endometriosis? Is it endometriosis? Endometriosis is a common cause of abdominal pain in young adults, but the overall incidence in adolescent females appears to be low based on diagnosis by pediatric surgeons. As pediatric surgeons, we are often the surgical gynecologist for many patients and frequently perform diagnostic laparoscopies for abdominal pain. Young patients who present to gynecology with chronic abdominal pain often saw three physicians prior to laparoscopy for confirmation of endometriosis, leading to a 23-month delay in treatment. Is the incidence in pediatric population higher than we think and a source of pain we should be considering during a diagnostic laparoscopy? The first step in this evaluation requires knowing what endometriosis looks like. Its appearance is varied, but in adolescence, we are more likely to see red and clear lesions. If it is a diagnosis we are missing, how should we evaluate? We begin in the anterior cul-de-sac, the area above the bladder and anterior to the uterus. Here you see red lesions with adhesions, dark lesions and red lesions, and white lesions along the bladder flap. Then, we evaluate the bilateral round ligaments as they insert into the inguinal canal, with red and dark lesions demonstrated here. Next, examine the appendix and bowel. Here's an appendix with multiple red lesions. The appendix here appears normal, but with careful examination, there is a single red lesion at the tip. Then, run the bowel with particular attention to the cecum and sigmoid colon, as they are often involved. Next, proceed to the upper abdomen and diaphragm. After visualizing the liver, gallbladder, and stomach, evaluate the diaphragm. Here, you can see multiple white and dark lesions along the right hemidiaphragm. Diaphragmatic endometriosis can become quite extensive with miliary distribution of lesions. This diaphragmatic endometriosis is accompanied by a liver lesion. Turning our attention south, we subsequently examine the presacral space. Looking from the aortic bifurcation cranially, the sacral promontory caudally, and common iliac vessels bilaterally. Then, move anteriorly to the ovaries and fallopian tubes. With lateral retraction of the ovary, multiple dark lesions are demonstrated, with care taken to examine all surfaces of the ovary. Gentle manipulation of the fallopian tube shows a single dark lesion in the ampullary portion. Evaluation of the contralateral ovary and fallopian tube shows a similar lesion that appears to partially obstruct indigo carmine dye extravasation. Next, we examine the pelvic sidewall. With gentle medial retraction of the ovary, a red lesion is seen over the right ureter. As the ureter travels distally, darker lesions are seen. Along the left pelvic wall, white lesions are seen, with white, red, and clear lesions seen along the right pelvic wall. Medial rotation of the rectosigmoid allows for evaluation of the right pericolic gutter, revealing a white lesion. We finish the examination with the posterior cul-de-sac, wherein you can see a miliary pattern of fibrosis or isolated red and white lesions along the rectum. Tips. Be sure to evaluate peritoneal defects as they may hide endometriotic lesions. Remember, hemosiderin deposits can look similar to red lesions, but wash away with suction and irrigation. 
To evaluate depth of lesions, vaginal exam, rectal exam, and sigmoidoscopy are key adjuncts. Consideration of endometriosis should be included in all laparoscopies for abdominal pain in the adolescent female. Evaluation should be routine and systematic. For additional information, please contact education at najat.com. Thank you. This paper is now open for discussion. So, um, the, the, Dr. Hanke, the, the first question I have is, um, is the, the way that we destroy the lesions, are there options for, for getting this, rid of these lesions, either with Archon Beam or other sources? Yeah, so it, it depends on the depth of your lesion, um, and this is something that will like, come along with more experience. Um, but a lot of it um, first starts with that biopsy that you can send off and know that it's endometriosis in the first place. Um, I don't know that we're going to be seeing the most extensive um, version of endometriosis, um, as you see that more often in the adult population. For, for pediatric surgeons, we're most likely going to be seeing the more subtle, like white clear blebs that we need to be aware of like what exactly it is, because that could be that source of pain in a patient that traditionally gets a negative laparoscopy diagnosis from us. And then the second question is, um, you know, we see a lesion on the fallopian tube that's moderately deep. Um, are we excising that? It's a good question, um, and to be honest, I would have to talk to my like gynecology, like pediatric gynecology colleagues, for um, a, a thorough answer to it. We have a question on the far right. It's really hard to see. It's yeah, it's extremely difficult to see. Luis Martinez, uh, Tampa, Florida. I was just wondering. It seems like this is. Medi a medical condition, finally, that you would treat the patient probably with birth control pills, isn't it? So I, I wonder what the importance of detecting so multiple little lesions is. If you could demonstrate that one or two lesions are present and you have just a narrow option of treatment, uh, wouldn't that be sufficient? So medical treatment alone is not sufficient for all endometriosis. Um, and for patients that are coming in and actually getting a diagnostic laparoscopy, they also often have already failed treatment with um, OCPs. So uh, actual like resection of the lesions improves symptoms overall. Would you go in and, and chase every single of those lesions that are hiding from your site, really? Do you resect them all, then? Is that their recommendation? Um, as a resident, no, because I, I actually haven't seen it. Um, but in talking to our gynecology colleagues, they do. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next presentation. Thank you. So as most of you know, we're um, uh, doing tributes uh, during uh, our 50th uh, anniversary of ABSA. And so this uh, session is dedicated to Drs. Uh, Thomas Holder and Dr. Keith Ashcraft. Dr. Holder was uh, ABSA's sixth president, and, as a tr and he was a charter member. And then uh, Dr., um, uh, Dr. Ashcraft was the 27th president of ABSA. And uh, these uh, videos were, were, uh, were prepared by uh, Dr. Uh, Charlene uh, uh, Dekonenko and Dr. Robert Dorman. So if we can roll those videos. Dr. Holder was really a pioneer in the Midwest. Uh, he was originally practicing at uh, Kansas University Medical Center, then moved over to Children's Mercy. Well, he's the guy who first brought pediatric surgery to Kansas City. And he really, really established the pattern of pediatricians referring patients to pediatric surgeons. Oh, I think Tom was was most respected in his field. He was the fifth president of APSA, I think, and the first four were Gross, Coop, Clatworthy, and they were four four giants. But Tom was the first one that was the second generation. But at one time, doctors. Um Holder and Ashcraft performed cardiac surgery, general surgery, and urology. 
uh, and it was very, very, very unusual for anyone to do all three. And he's responsible for, certainly for the development of surgery at Children's Mercy, but uh, for the development of uh, surgery within the field of pediatrics. Tom Holder uh, was pediatric surgery in this part of the world. A marvelous surgeon, mm -hmm. marvelous surgeon. Sometimes a little difficult to work with. The residents all thought that their middle name was Goddamn. And he was giving a lecture one time uh, as a visiting professor, and this eager young physician came up to him and said, Dr. Holder, uh, that was wonderful talk. You may remember me uh, from my days at Children's Mercy, and Dr. Holder had a blank stare on his face, and then this eager young fellow says, well, I rotated on your service. Well, you, you used to yell at me a lot. And Dr. Holder said, that doesn't narrow the field very much. <laughs> you pay attention to that. You don't, you don't skip the, the details. People do much better. Stuff. All the residents and all of us really were kind of awestricken just by his demeanor and, you know, never wanted to screw up, wanted to do whatever you could do to get his respect for you. He looked like you pictured a surgeon should look, and he acted that way. Dr. Holder um, brought a certain amount of class to the institution. He was very dedicated to teaching and to making sure that the kids got really good care. He, he trained a generation of people that went off and many became directors of training programs themselves and so I think he had a national and international uh, impact and he had a uh, big impact locally. He was very highly regarded and by pediatricians and by uh, colleagues at the hospital and other specialties and, and by people that worked with him. So. Huh. And Tom couldn't have been a met, better mentor than he was to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and we just saw me through all of the all of the training and the preparation and the and the early practice and we're still they're very good friends. It left the hospital a better place certainly and I think the hospital's reputation was based on their reputation. They taught so many people over the course of the years. Pediatric surgeons all over the country have been impacted and the children that they cared for, you know have been blessed with their knowledge. Keith Ashcraft was born in Kansas, graduated high school, and attended college there, pursuing a career in veterinary medicine. He worked in a lab where he met Marvel Jennings Harbaugh. At one time he said, you know, he said you're wasting your time in vet medicine. The way you dissect, you ought to be a surgeon. My whole life just changed right there. After a stint in the Army, he attended medical school at KU, where he met Dr. Holder, who inspired him to pursue pediatric surgery. He graduated in 1963, starting his journey to become a pediatric surgeon. I went on to Boston. Joe Murray, who was a, a surgeon there, he asked me three questions. He says, how many papers have you written? And what do you have to bring, in, bring to the Brigham, and why should we take you? And I didn't have an answer for any of the three, so I went back to Kansas City. So I had surgery in July of 1977, and the first person I saw was Keith Ashcraft. I signed a scrub with him, and so I did 15 hernias that day. He was probably the, the best technical surgeon I ever scrubbed with. He was a good teacher, and he was an excellent first assistant. He made you think you could do anything. So you needed to go operate with other people to make sure you knew that you weren't that good because he could make you feel like the world. The he was so fast. He was very, very efficient. And uh, it was hard to keep up with him. Keith would come back in and help you change over the room. He would help open. He would do whatever needed to be done to keep the day moving. Outside of that, his operating room was uh, fun to be in. The zoo had uh, a chimp, a chimpanzee, that had hernias. And they brought the chimp in in his little sleeper, just like a baby, and we fixed his hernias. <laughs> <laughs> 
W.B. Saunders called Tom one time in 1979 or 80 and said, we want to do another edition of Gross's book. Tom called Gross and asked him if it would be okay if we did this, and Gross said, hell no. Uh, so Saunders asked us to do a different one. So the first Holder and Ashcraft text was published in 1980. There were several tenets of that book that they felt were important. One uh, was that it was a single volume, it was very readable, it had uh, some emphasis on urology, uh, and it was international in scope. The pinnacle, I think, was probably getting to be the president of Epson. Lucian wanted a, wanted a logo. I don't know whether it was a doll or whether I went over to the nursery and got a real kid and came back up to Tom Holder's office with this, and Lucian had his camera there, and he took a whole bunch of pictures. I was wearing a scrub suit. It was, uh, became the logo in, up until last year. Well, I think I'm the most proud of the people that we've turned out, the trainees that we've had. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, there are six or seven of those residents who are the chiefs of their respective pediatric surgical programs mm -hmm. around the country. What they did for the hospitals really has gotten the, uh, the hospital recognized nationally and internationally. I don't know, it's been just one hell of a nice career. It's, it's really, really been fun. There were times when it was exasperating, times when you were tired, but uh, you know, I always look forward to coming to work and operating. But, I can't imagine being an anesthesiologist, watching everybody, those guys having all the fun. <laughs>
if female applicant letters were more likely to contain the phrase, the applicant has a supportive spouse or family. We found no difference in detailed research description or the phrase, the applicant is mature. When we look closer at social communal phrasing, female applicant letters contained um, more phrases referring to a strong marriage or parental guidance. In fact, 5% of email letters referred to a spouse's accomplishments or achievements. However, this practice was not observed in a single male applicant's letter. When we looked closer at research language, we found that nearly all letters of recommendation referenced an applicant's research involvement, and there was no difference in research experience or accomplishments discussed. However, the language used to discuss an applicant's research was significantly different. We found that for male applicants, the, the applicant was described as an agent of his research, such as he published or he developed through active possessive language where female applicants were more likely to be described through passive possessive language, such as her contributions resulted in presentations or she was an author. This resulted in the female applicant's research being described as a form of service or a contribution to a research environment as a whole. Thus, in conclusion, we found that the gender schema does exist for letters of recommendation for fellowship applicants, and that male applicant letters contained more agentic terms, terms referring to future success, in-group discourse, and active possessive language, where female applicant letters contained um, our social communal phrases and passive possessive language. Qualifying female applicants through their spouse's accomplishments remains an interesting finding. <laughs> Thank you. So this paper is now open for discussion. Before we take questions, I have to ask, did you look at um, whether or not these factors impacted successfully matching? Yes, so um, we did, I did not include this, so that's a common question. So we did not see a difference in, in, a, in ultimate success rate, yes. Okay. Uh, middle mic. Andreas Meyer, uh, SUNY Upstate. Uh, very interesting, unfortunately, this is something that's known uh, even in other specialties as well. Mm -hmm. um, What's your recommendation how to address this? Do all letter writers need some uh, implicit uh, unconscious bias training, or what should we do better? Sure, exactly. So I think in general, unconscious bias training um, does not hurt. In fact, multiple studies show that the more objective a person feels through writing a letter of a recommendation, the least objective they actually are. So importantly, unconscious bias is not, is not intentional. So a letter writer who describes as supportive spouse or family is probably doing that to try to advantage the, the, the applicant. But the flip side is that a female applicant can probably stand on their own qualifications and do not need to be qualified through a spouse or a family. Um, so unconscious bias training, as well as looking over your own letter of recommendation to make sure you haven't included these things, I think are extremely important. We have another question to our right. Well, I, I don't have a question, Cynthia Reyes, Orlando. Um, but I do thank you very, very much for bringing this to the attention of our esteemed um, colleagues here. Yes, this information has been disseminated um, in other uh, venues, other um, industries. But I think in, in the world of medicine that we are still lagging behind um, when, in identifying that there is a true unconscious bias. And um, it does affect us in many ways. The terms, the agentive terms that you, that you uh, listed, um, if, if women were to behave in, in those fashions, it would, it would be looked upon negatively um, as, uh, uh, as opposed to in a male where it's, it would be seen as a positive attribute. An assertive woman, aggressive woman, oftentimes is not viewed in, in positive ways. So um, your, your paper does, does not only indicate um, a, a need to open our eyes to the way we write letters, 
but also to the way we view uh, our, our, our female colleagues. Um, and I, this, is, this paper will be reviewed by our new committee, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, which I'm vice chair, and I think you are um, right on track with helping us um, move in, in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank We're you. going to move on to our next presentation. Sorry. Thank you. So our, our uh, uh, next talk is Assessment of Operative Autonomy and Readiness for Independent Practice Among Pediatric Surgery Fellows, presented by Benjamin Zendahas from Boston Children's Hospital. Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Benjamin Sunday. We're going to talk about operative performance of pediatric surgery fellows. Uh, nothing to disclose. Uh, so up until recently, we had, for the most part, been assessing performance with the OPRS paper forms, which were adapted from general surgery OPRS forms. They're a little bit lengthy, and uh, they're only uh, specific to certain index cases, so seven categories. This is like an example of one of those. It's for an inguinal hernia repair in an infant, five pages long. But you can see these two last uh, free text box at the end were often where the most meaningful feedback was conveyed to the trainee. Oftentimes, unfortunately, it was left empty. Uh, and we struggle with this here in Boston. Uh, in a three-year period that we looked at this, we on average had about nine and a half evaluations per fellow per year. This represents only about one to two percent of all eligible cases. I think we can do better than that. And one of the problems was, you know, we're all busy. And so when uh, a trainee approached a faculty member, this is sort of the role of eyes that we all had. It was disruptive to our, our, our busy lifestyle, right? So in my uh, book, uh, the, the ideal wish list has a long laundry list of idealistic items that I wish we all had. But my point with this is not to go into detail with each point of this, but more to, to bring to you to your attention that it's not that far from reality. We do have some available tools to our um, use. And one of those tools, which I think comes very close to the ideal operative assessment form, is called Simple. Some of you may be using um, a, a, another one called SwishMe, and we'll go into details later about the differences. But Simple stands for System for Measuring Procedure Learning. It was developed by a nonprofit multi-institutional research consortium. It allows the opportunity for both the trainee and the faculty to trigger the evaluation at the end of the case. It allows for three questions. Autonomy scale, the SWISH scale, performance, case difficulty, dictated feedback, takes only four taps to complete, essentially less than 20 seconds. Very straightforward. So the SWISH scale is developed by Dr. Swishenberg, and uh, essentially four levels of guidance, show and tell, active help, passive help, and supervision only. Uh, so SIMPLE was widely implemented and used in adult general surgery programs. Uh, we had to make some modifications to be able to use it for pediatric surgery. We developed a procedural taxonomy directly from the ACGME case log. Uh, we pilot tested it and fully implemented it a single uh, training program here in Boston. I was three fellows for that year, two senior, one junior, and 21 of our surgical faculty underwent frame of reference rater training to be able to use this tool. At one year of use, we collected the data, analyzed, uh, and surveyed our participants. So this is what we encounter. From 1% to 2% of all eligible cases, we went up all the way up to 39% of cases. I still think we have some work to do and to get that better, but 565 assessments, we felt quite good about that. Not only it captured increased number of assessments, but a wider variety of cases, so 148 unique procedures, so not just index cases, which will come to that. Average response time was about eight and a half hours. It does have a, a limit to three days to respond to limit recall bias. And interestingly, about 60% of the assessments had dictated feedback. First year fellow was more likely to have dictated feedback than the second year fellow. It does a pretty good job at distinguishing between different levels of performance. As you can see here, uh, meaningful autonomy ratings and practice ready performance ratings were more likely in the second year fellows as one would expect. Uh, it did not appear to matter in terms of case complexity. It was similar for both. This is one of my sort of favorite slides to show you. Uh, it shows that over time, as you would expect, they all improve. Uh, but at the beginning of the academic quarter, you almost have different autonomy set points, so to speak. So ratings of meaningful autonomy uh, were different for these two groups. But over time, you see how they become much closer. But the more important thing here is for that first year fellow to demonstrate that his ratings of meaningful autonomy are close to that second year fellow, demonstrate that he's ready to move on to that second year for the most part. So uh, as I mentioned, we not only uh, looked into index cases, so the top five procedures were, for the most part, bread and butter, general surgery cases, and so laparous, pocket, or myotomies, if we looked that into a little more detail, and you think that anything above 
passive help is considered meaningful autonomy. You see how the first case for that junior fellow was pretty much show and tell. He had never done one. As uh, cases evolved, he got roughly around case four and five, he got to passive help and supervision only, but he still did not achieve that consistency of supervision only uh, that the second year fellows achieved early, early on in their second year. So we have to follow this learning curve a little further out to see where that consistency comes. We can see how this can apply to understand how many cases are truly needed to uh, achieve that autonomy. So we surveyed our participants. The majority felt that less than a minute would be appropriate to, to complete an assessment. This obviously only takes 20 seconds to do. Uh, we uh, had a majority felt that all cases should get an assessment. The majority enjoyed plenty of the features of the simple uh, assessment, but dictated feedback was the most valued by trainees and faculty. Uh, we were concerned and obviously wanted to make sure that it did not impact the delivery of face-to-face -face feedback. For the most part, it appeared to make no difference to the delivery of face-to-face -face feedback, although some faculty felt that it improved the delivery of such feedback because it provided a framework in which to have a conversation with the trainee in terms of how to improve things. So in conclusion, I think Simple can improve the quantity for sure and possibly the quality of the feedback we provide. It definitely does a good job of distinguishing between levels of performance. It has a good job at providing longitudinal performance assessment in, in order to be able to detect uh, opportunities for early remediation. We talked about the, being a platform to assess the minimum number of cases needed. Uh, it does not replace face-to-face -face feedback, and I think uh, the dictated portion of it was the most valid by the trainees. So thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Zendejas. Um, I will ask a question. How do you propose we implement this app when so many programs are using Zwish at this time? Uh, I don't think it matters a whole lot which one you use, but rather the assessments are done. Um, I think there's some advantages between uh, simple uh, over a swish uh, that we can go into. Um, I can kind of show you some of those. Uh, simple does have a new feature that uh, uh, was integrated with the ACGME case lock, so that makes it a lot easier for the uh, trainees to uh, uh, comply with that as they can log their cases with ACGME. Uh, it's, there's a lot more research and validity evidence behind Simple because it's been used so extensively in, in general surgery programs. Uh, and as the applicants come through to our programs, at some point you can envision how we can use this information to, uh, uh, over time, track their performance from residency into fellowship and have some longitudinal data across uh, training environments. Uh, so, um, so we can have a full session on, on the differences between the two approaches. But essentially, I think the importance is to have the culture change of, of uh, assessing operative performance so we can kind of track our outcomes a little bit better. The question to our right. Sure. Uh, Jason Fisher, NYU. Um, so Ben, really, really great work. I have a, a lot of personal interest in this. So just a, a comment and then a question. So uh, one of the things we've done at NYU is um, we've sort of done a homegrown version of this where we've actually um, linked it to the electronic health record so that actually when you complete mm -hmm. The operation, autom the um, the, the evaluation automatically gets pinged because we found that one of the problems was getting people to actually initiate these evaluations. Um, uh, the other nice thing with that is that you can actually, through IRB, you can actually link it back to the clinical record. So over time, you can actually track outcomes based on residency competency. So. There's a lot of flexibility with tools like this, so I encourage programs to continue to look into it. My question for you, though, is um, what was, because uh, I couldn't tell from your data, what was your compliance? So you said something like 568 assessments, but was that 568 assessments that went out and got completed? Um, like, was it 100% compliance every time someone got presented? Because uh, we found that sometimes is an issue. Thank you. Really great work. Yeah, thanks. Uh, to your point, uh, the... Um Compliance obviously varies, um, and uh, some months are better than others. For the most part, we get about 40 to 50% uh, response rate for the assessments that are uh, sent in. Uh, I think we have some strategies to improve that. Uh, we're uh, actively uh, showing the faculty at faculty meetings their compliance rate, and their, uh, uh, the fellows also have a, a big deal in this, so um, it is something we're working on. Thank you. Thanks. Our next presentation is Artificial Intelligence and Visual Recognition in Computer-Aided Diagnoses, a Proof-of-Concept Femur Fracture Model. This is being presented by Dr. Alejandra Casar Barra Saluce from Cincinnati Children's. Hi, everyone. Like they said, I'm Alejandra Maria Casalvera Saluce, a research fellow from Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And I'm going to talk to you about machine learning and image recognition. In this case, that proof of concept femur fracture model. 
Uh, our team has no disclosures related to this project. Uh, and pretty much, machine learning is the process in, we, in which we teach computers to make decisions based on pattern recognition. Uh, and we can do this in two ways. The first one's called supervised learning, and that's where we give uh, computers a frame of reference. We give them examples that are labeled, and we have them sort the data, uh, the data for us. A second way in which we can teach them is called unsupervised learning. And here, we just give them the data in bulk and let them make their own conclusions in a process known as clustering. And in this, they can find associations that we were not aware existed before. Our process is going to be based on supervised learning. Uh, the range of tasks that can be accomplished with visual recognition ranges from classification, that's just labeling, uh, to segmentation, that's more complex, allows us to trace structures, and is very useful for 3D analysis. Uh, our project is going to be based on a classification algorithm. Old school or traditional machine learning uh, had this very important second step uh, called feature extraction. And that is a step that required intensive uh, labor, time, effort, uh, investment uh, to annotate images and run some filters through them. And it made machine learning uh, take a long time and be very expensive. Uh, the second wave of machine learning is called deep learning, and it pretty much obviates the need for that step where the computer's taking care of it. Uh, it brings us a lot of biases because it is a black box algorithm where we don't know what the computer's looking at, but at the same time, it allows us to train systems with way more data, and it's what is responsible for all the recent ad advancements in machine learning and other fields. Our process is going to be using deep learning. Uh, our protocol is actually very uh, simple. It was a proof of concept just to test our workflow. Uh, so a Google image search was performed. Uh, we obtained 80 uh, femur x-rays uh, under a fair use policy. We randomized them into training and testing items, and then the training items were used uh, and loaded into the graphic user interface for IBM Watson. Uh, an algorithm was constructed automatically, and then we ran our test items through said algorithm. Our results are as follows. Uh, we established a diagnostic threshold of 0.8 uh, in our algorithm value and achieved a diagnostic accuracy of 100% with this. As you can tell, the fractures here are very evident. And that's clear because we needed a large effect size difference uh, to be able to train a model with such a limited sample size. Uh, in addition to, the, uh, to this, the values recorded for both groups were statistically significantly different. After this, uh, we coded an app uh, with algorithm just as a proof of concept to see how this implementation could work in the future. Uh, and we were successful at that. This project, as you can tell, has absolutely no external validity. Uh, we cannot apply this algorithm to images we are obtaining if we were to take an x-ray right now of a patient. And that's because the quality of the data is very terrible. If you think about an image Google, uh, Google image search, you're going to get images of very different sizes, colors, uh, pixel uh, complexity. Uh, so this is just to test our workflow once again. Uh, I like to say, this is the mountain where I learned how to ski. It's just an hour from here. And our project right now is at that level. It's still on training wheels. Uh, but the preliminary data we've obtained with this and other projects we've run of similar uh, depth uh, are allowing us to look forward to that black diamond slope. Uh, we've already secured some funding. Uh, we got a research grant funded through IPEG in March. And we have, it allows us to uh, move forward in our data sharing agreements and IRB approval uh, to attempt to replicate this in pediatric surgical diagnosis and other imaging modalities in our clinical uh, realm. So I'm happy to take any questions. And if you want to scan that QR code, you can get a copy of the presentation for any use. Thank you. So uh, this paper is uh, now open for discussion. So um, have you uh, thought about or have you um, anticipated how, um, how this is going to change when you go from Google Images to the huge amount of volume of, of a DICOM image? Yes. So uh, there's other papers out in the literature that have already used them. They use the old school uh, machine learning, not the new wave. Uh, but Pretty much once we get the DICOM images, we're going to have everything that is the same will look the same. So the background is more comparable in a DICOM image 
where all the pixels are a certain shade of, of black, or all the pictures are the same size. Uh, so that makes the different pixels or the different features stand out better. Uh, so the tendency is, as you get better quality images, your results are going to be better. And another thing we will get is that we will increase our sample size greatly, because uh, our, our clinical database at Sensi Children's is pretty, pretty robust. And then, um, do you have to pay for access to IBM Watson? And if so, how, um, uh, how cost prohibitive is that? So IBM Watson, all these projects have completed in a free version. You get uh, a limit of uh, 1,000 to 10,000 images you can run uh, per month. Uh, and there are several projects that you can load. You have to delete some after you start making the new ones. But uh, overall, even in the paid version, the cost is like one cent per image uh, to run, and then a very just nominal fee for the time it takes to run. Uh, so overall, even a project with 10 or 20,000 images could probably be under 200 bucks. Uh, I see a question on the far right. Yeah, sure. Take your uh, name. Yeah, uh, Jason Fisher, NYU again. So uh, it's really, really great work. I think um, uh, you know one of the interesting things about a lot of machine learning um, algorithms that I think when physicians hear is that it's like, are the robots going to put us out of business, you know, are they going to just take over radiology and ophthalmology exams? Those are in the pathologists. Those are always the examples. Um, but what I would um, offer to you as you're as you're looking at these models is realize that when you're constructing workflows, when you're trying to say, all right, well, how can I use this practically? And in, in, you know, that's sort of where you're where you're going. Um, really think hard about the role that the human being is still going to have in this. So, for instance, there are machine learning algorithms that um, that Google has run to say. Um, could you identify a barbell? And then over time, what it starts to do, if you don't give it enough instruction, it starts to identify a barbell with arms as what a barbell looks like because it just every picture of a barbell it sees, it has two arms attached to it. So it just thinks that a barbell is this thing with two hands attached to it. Um, or if you ask it to try and differentiate between the face of a puppy and the face of a chocolate chip muffin, um, when you zoom in, like, because it's saying, all right, I need three black circles and a brown background, it, it can't tell the difference between a chocolate chip muffin and a, and a puppy. Um, so, I, you know, th those are just two examples, but I think what, what I learned from that is that machine learning is fantastic, but um, it's not taking away our jobs, it's just going to augment them. And as you look to apply this type of project, um, you really want to think about how can I get these imaging processing programs to help me make decisions, not make the decisions for me, otherwise you're going to have a barbell with arms. But Good. really great work. Thanks. Thank you. So um, our uh, next talk is predictors of disparities in pediatric mortality from motor vehicle crashes among U.S. counties, uh, presented by um, uh, Ali uh, Makdad from from uh, University of Texas Southwestern. Yeah. Okay, so half the children that die from road traffic injuries die at the scene, and they never make it to a hospital. So is this something happening next to you, and what are you going to do about it? Road traffic injury is a leading cause of child deaths in the U.S. For every five child deaths, one of them is related to road traffic injuries. Previous examinations of the subjects have been conducted at the national and at the state levels. However, there is more value for gathering information specific to the county, because it is at the county level where policies and programs are designed and implemented. So in our study, we wanted to estimate the county level child mortality from road traffic injuries. We also wanted to evaluate the impact of trauma centers in a county on mortality, and we also wanted to evaluate the impact of urban classification of a county on child mortality. So we queried the fatality analysis reporting system between the years 2010 and 2017. This is a nationwide census of every single crash that led to a fatality within 30 days of the crash. We included children younger than the age of 15 years who died in the crash, and we used small area estimation methods to ultimately calculate age and sex standardized county-specific mortality. So what did we get? 
9,271 deaths over the eight-year eight period of the study. 49%, 49% died at the scene and never made it to a hospital. The median age was seven, 56, 56% were male, half of those were white. So the overall national mortality was 2.5 deaths per 100,000 children. At the county level, the, the county-specific mortality ranged from 0.3 to, to 29 deaths per 100,000 children. This is a hundredfold increase in mortality in the same country. So if you look at this map, you would notice that counties up in the northeast, around the Great Lakes, and around the west coast uh, have lower mortalities, whereas you are more likely to see higher mortalities in the middle and the south parts of the country. So we looked at trauma centers. We identified 552 level one or two adult trauma centers, and those were located in 11% of the counties in the country. And we identified 143 level one or two pediatric trauma centers, which were located only in 3% of the counties in the country. And if we map the distribution of pediatric trauma centers, you would see it tracking very closely with counties with the lowest percentiles of mortality. So it's not surprising to see that adult and pediatric trauma centers had a protective effect on child mortality from road traffic injuries. And more so in pediatric trauma centers, when they're available in a county, there was a 45% reduction in mortality. We also looked at urban rural classification of counties. We, used, we identified uh, six categories of urban rural classification based on the NCHS definitions. Two of those were considered rural, the micropolitan and the non-core, which made up 62% of the counties in the U.S. And it was interesting to see, as counties become more and more rural, child mortality linearly increased. So in conclusion, we identified in this study high-risk counties with excessive child mortality and limited access to trauma care. Now that we have this information, what should we do about it? And I think it's very important to start engaging with policymakers and healthcare stakeholders to disseminate our findings to them, to help them investigate high-risk clusters so that they can design and implement policies and guide resources to the areas that need them the most. This is it. Thank you very much. Very good. Andreas Marasuni, Upstate. A quick question, very interesting data. Um, I'm a little confused. Initially, you said that 53% of the children die at the scene. Did you look at the data? Is there a difference between the counties there, or is the difference really in the kids that potentially can be salvaged? Um, the difference, I didn't quite understand what you mean by the, the difference. So if 53% of the kids die at the scene, did you see a difference in the counties that had a higher mortality in the rate of kids that die at the scene? Is it higher in those counties, or is the difference really uh, related to the kids that make it to the hospital? I see. Uh, so when we looked at the pre-hospital deaths uh, and categorized it by county, 50, in rural counties, up to 55% died at the scene, whereas in the largest metropolitan uh, counties, it was around 28%. So there is a big impact, obviously, related to uh, less urban counties. But there is still a large percentage of deaths related uh, that are happening um, at, on the streets before the kids make it to the hospital. John Bleacher, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, if these are deaths that are occurring before making it to the trauma centers, uh, are you speculating that the, the rates are lower because of the trauma center's proximity and therefore their injury prevention programs are in play or their education to EMS is making a difference? Or is it just that the rural areas are going to have people going 80 miles an hour and, and not complying with seatbelt laws uh, versus congested traffic and lower uh, 
uh, rates of speed and uh, less impact in the more urban areas? Yeah, thank you for your question. I mean, this is the, the, the big question over here. Is it related to the trauma centers? Is it related to the urbanicity? Uh, from a statistics standpoint, just looking at uh, the models, it seems rural uh, versus urban classifications had the biggest impact. Uh, but I don't think there is one answer to every single county, and this is why high-risk clusters sometimes need to be investigated, whether this is related to an issue with one interstate that uh, has some issues with response times or, or uh, stuff related to pre-hospital triaging. Um, the difficulty is that uh, a lot of these pediatric centers or adult trauma centers are in counties with uh, more populated and more urban. Sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to tease out uh, whether having trauma centers that has a bigger effect on the entire service area or the county because now you have uh, trauma systems in place that play into effect that can be a cause. Some studies have looked into rural areas, more alcohol use potentially, higher speeds, uh, longer uh, times of EMS at the scene. Hard to tease out. So that's why I think identifying some of these high-risk clusters and looking at exactly people in Dallas and the outskirts of Dallas would know more about what's going on if, if this is a high-risk area versus Arizona and Maricopa County or, or I don't think it's one uh, answer to all of those. It's a combination, of course. So I'm sorry, but we're going to have to close. Uh, Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our final presentation is timing of nutritional assistance benefit distribution is associated with rates of admission for child abuse and neglect, an interstate analysis of 3,574 admissions, which will be presented by Dr. Daniel Solomon from Yale. Thank you. On behalf of my co-authors, I'm honored to present. Uh, this is a fairly dry and clinical title. Um, that belies the emotionality behind what we sought to explore. Our question is truly, are children of hungry families at risk for abusive injury? Perhaps the most eloquent reference to the link between hunger and violence is attributed to the journalist Alfred Henry Lewis in 1906. I think Mr. Lewis was a patient man, however. I don't think I could go hungry for three days before attempting the violent overthrow of the federal government. I consider it these days if I miss my morning coffee. Joanne Wood and the Policy Lab at CHOP evaluated the correlation between macroeconomic indicators and abusive head trauma. In 74 counties in Appalachia, abusive head count, uh, trauma increased from 9.8 cases per 100,000 at the start of the Great Recession to 15.6 per 100,000 during the recession's height. This correlated geographically with rates of mortgage defaults. The economist Orgel Ozturk in South Carolina correlated microeconomic factors to student achievement. In this study, she found that as the number of days between distribution of food stamp benefits and a statewide standardized test increased, performance on that test decreased. In short, empty stomachs worsened test scores. Putting these two theories together, we hypothesize that microeconomic factors correlate with rates of interpersonal violence. To put this explicitly, we hypothesize that the timing of supplemental nutritional program, SNAP, or food stamp benefits, correlates with admissions for non-accidental trauma. To prove this hypothesis, imagine a hypothetical municipality. In this city, 30 children are admitted for non-accidental trauma each month. If non-accidental trauma were truly a random event, over multiple months, the number of admissions in a given day would approach the average, one. But now, imagine there was a variable that imparted a protective effect against non-accidental trauma. In our example, this is a full refrigerator. If the fridge was filled at the start of the month, the same 30 admissions would be shifted rightward. This allows us to compute an O to E ratio, <clears throat> or the number of admissions observed per unit time over the number of admissions that would be observed if admissions were randomly occurring and evenly distributed event. 
in our hypothetical example, on the 30th day of the month, our O to E would equal 3. We can then compare this effect between states. For example, in the great state of Connecticut, SNAP benefits are distributed on one of the first three days of the month. That means on the 30th day of the month, the average family has gone 28 days since receiving nutrition benefits. Whereas in Georgia, distribution of benefits occurs during one of the first 23 days of the month. The average time on the 30th day of the month since a family has received benefits is 11 days. Therefore, we can compare the effective size between distribution windows in between states. In furtherance of this goal, we utilize the Pediatric Health Information System database to identify dates of admission for abused children between 2012 and 2018. States with a distribution window of 15 days or less were identified as short distribution window states and are pictured in red. States with a benefit distribution of 20 days or more are considered long distribution window states and are pictured in blue. 22 states within the FIS had centers that met criteria. 7,900 patients were identified. As you can see, baseline demographics between short distribution and long distribution states were not significantly different, with the exception of the percentage of patients receiving Medicare benefits, which is not surprising given that this is an analysis of difference in state-to-state -state implementation of a federal program. This figure ultimately demonstrates the correlation between time from receipt of food assistance and the rates of abusive, head in, uh, I'm sorry, of abusive injury. On the left of this figure are the mean observed to expected rates that were calculated during the differential benefit distribution windows for each individual state. For example, with Connecticut's three-day distribution window, the ODE was generated for the first three days of the month. For Georgia's 23-day window, the ODE was calculated for the first 23 days of the month. There were no statistical difference between these groups, and there were no differences between these groups and an ODE of one. Short distribution states are in red, and long window states are in blue. When we move to the right side of the graph, the ODE ratios for the last seven calendar days of the month are calculated. In the short window states, where the average family has gone 11 days from receipt of benefits to the, start of, to the end of the period, children are 7% more likely to be admitted with abusive injuries than if the injuries were randomly distributed events over the month. In blue, there is no difference from random distribution in the long window states where the average family has gone six days from benefit distribution to the end of the month. If there's a difference in mortality, this study was underpowered to predict it. I have no doubt that each of you has been mentally accumulating a list of the shortcomings of this analysis. Let me help you. <laughs> Given that this was a retrospective analysis of an administrative database, it relies on the fidelity of diagnostic coding. Only encounters with specific codes for abusive trauma were captured. This, is, this no doubt undercaptures uh, the rates of abusive trauma. Also, this study does not account for other social welfare programs, like social security disability benefits, or state and municipality administered funds. Nevertheless, it appears that time from SNAP benefit distribution is correlated with rates of admission for abusive injury. Or to put it more bluntly, hungry families are possibly at risk for abusive injury. I'd now be honored to take your questions. So uh, we, we only have time for one question. Hi, I'm Lauren Berman from Nemours in Delaware. Uh, that was a really fantastic talk and a topic that is no doubt a lot higher on all of our radars after yesterday's symposium. But I'm just wondering if you can, if you were to present this to a policymaker, what is your message? Is it that benefits need to be distributed more often? Is it just not enough are distributed? How do you kind of translate this into action? When, you know, and I've been giving this talk to my wife and, uh, and my friends and, and lay people, they often fall into the, um, this logical trap that if you give the benefits more often or increase the benefit window, that you'll erase this effect that I've seen. That's true, 
but I don't suspect that it's going to change the incidence of abusive trauma. I think that the true thesis statement of this topic is the longer you go without help, the more likely you are to lash out at your children. And the only um, real policy measure that I could propose is to do more for people, um, more food benefits, more housing benefits, um, heating, electricity, education, and whatnot, social welfare. So that concludes this morning's session. We just want to remind everyone with scorecards to please turn them in. And thank you to all of our speakers.